innovation and today we're going to be talking about some different tools for your innovation practice when it comes to ideation and starting to really hone in on taking some wonderful creative ideas and making sure that they are feasible. So we've talked a lot in the past about divergent and convergent thinking. Right now we're using a tool to transition our thought process from that very divergent where we're, we're, we're just milling around a whole lot of different ideas in our heads and we're moving in convergence, focusing those ideas in to make sure that we are pulling in the most feasible idea of all. And so I'm mentioning Eureka Ranch here because Eureka Ranch happens to be a really amazing center that focuses on ideation and innovation practice. And We'll talk a little bit more about them in a second, but just to note, I am not affiliated with Eureka Ranch and I am not um, monetizing this slide. I'm talking about their tools and I totally encourage you to investigate Eureka Ranch and find out more about the tool sets that they offer as part of your innovation practice. So at the end of this video, you'll be able to research Eureka Ranch tools for innovation engineering and identify if uh, taking part in some of their workshops or um, using some of their tools that are available for purchase makes sense for your organization. We're going to use a yellow card tool as a mechanism for focusing ideation and we'll uh, uh, give thanks to Eureka Ranch for sharing um, this tool with us. We are also going to use stage gating strategy for product ideation and innovation pipelining. And what do I mean by this? We're using different tools and mechanisms to make sure that we are um, taking a point to reflect on the quality of our work, on the quality of our project, to make sure that it makes sense to move forward. And stage gating just implies we've got those stops and starts in the process to make sure that we are moving forward in a cost-effective and meaningful manner. There's no point in pushing an idea forward if it's not going to be profitable and if it's not going to bring a benefit to our organization or to ourselves. And so Stage gating just means we're stopping and reflecting and before moving too far ahead, we're going through that evaluation process. So as I mentioned, Eureka Ranch is a innovation service provider and I'm going to just keep on talking here informally as if we were in class together. I'm notorious for doing this. And just to show you, Eureka Ranch is a innovation think tank and training company. They train people in innovation. And it just happens that um, a couple of years ago, we had uh, Chef Scott Brown in to do a workshop with our students. And we used the yellow card tool. Scott Brown just happens to be a trained innovation engineer through Eureka Ranch. And at various points in his career, he has been um, a leader in product innovation. Um, uh, he had a recent role with Highliner as their director of culinary innovation, and currently he is working in private consulting, working with a wide variety of different clients across North America. He was the one who introduced us to the yellow card, and he shared a tool which we have modified for students. I highly recommend taking some time and finding the book Driving Eureka. It does have some really great resources when it comes to um, innovation practice. You know I love books and I love encouraging people to find the time to read. It's also available as an audiobook and so it's something that you could be listening to while commuting or driving to work. Take the time to read and find out more about the resources that Eureka Ranch could provide. I realize it's a costly investment but many times as people get um, moving along in their careers, if you are in research and development or product development management, oftentimes companies will invest in your personal training. And this, um, this suite of services when it comes to innovation management is extremely valuable. I've often thought about asking for a time to be able to attend it myself. And so far I'm doing okay, <laughs> but don't be surprised if in a, in a in the future, I go and take part in some of the workshops. So let's jump into the yellow card. So a yellow card, we we modified it slightly from the format that 
is used from Eureka Rich, but the idea behind a yellow card is that it's a focusing tool, that you want to take all of the fanciful ideas that you have generated through your ideation and start to really think about what you are working on. So if we consider, I've been talking about mochi ice cream. What is our news headline? Cool in more ways than one. Why did I say that? What we're trying to do is have a unique one line focusing phrase. Why do we think that we need to have that singular phrase? If you have to ramble on and on and on about what your product is delivering, then honestly, you need to go back and reflect a little bit more. I said cool in more ways than one. That just automatically came to the top of my head. Why? Because mochi is very trendy and Asian desserts are extremely trendy right now. But it's also cool because it's a frozen dessert. So who are my stakeholders? We've we spent last week thinking about demographics and profiling who are the people who are going to be purchasing our products. Well, in this case, it's going to be people who are interested in culinary adventure and try new flavors. Um, amusement, so in frozen, frozen novelties. I want you to think about who are these people. So they're likely middle class. And why middle class? Because this is, this is a more premium product. Uh, it's going to cost more per unit than, let's say, a Freezy Popsicle or some of the discount products. What is the problem that it is solving? It is solving Asian fusion in the frozen dessert. What's their benefits? Uh, so that's our pro uh, right now there is no Asian fusion in the frozen desserts aisle in most North American grocery stores. I'm trying to think of anything that really comes to mind. And uh, without stepping into some of the ethnic retailers, there's really not a lot of mainstream. Mochi is one of the few products that is bridging into mainstream. And so you've got that possibility to bridge. Benefits promise. This is where we're making a claim stating what is that customer going to be enjoying? And it's going to be new flavor experience. Actually, not just flavor, but texture. The frozen dessert. So we're creating a new, a new uh, minor subcategory within the frozen dessert category, uh, um, aisle. And what we're really focusing in on is there's lots of popsicles and there's only so much innovation in popsicles. There's lots of frozen novelties like um, drumstick cones and um, different shaped products. But this is really pushing into a completely different flavor and texture experience in the frozen dessert aisle. And do we have proof? This is where we, we talked a little bit about uh, collecting market data. This is where you would put in market data for sales of frozen novelties. I appreciate that getting some of this market data is sometimes hard and oftentimes it's paywalled. Where you have to pay to a market data service such as Mintel or um, MPD or um, Nielsen. Some of these different organizations have a variety of different paywalls and I appreciate as a student, you may not be able to access all of this. If you were in the industry, you would be paying out for that market data. Customer price. We will have another module where we talk about different pricing models, but in general, you are going to be looking at what are the competitive prices for comparable products, and you will state it as a manufacturer's suggested retail price, MSRP, suggested retail price, and let's say it's going to be we're likely looking at $1.50 per unit. These are premium products. These are not cheap. And so if you're having a uh, so box of six would be $9. This So manufacturer's suggested retail price, we will have a completely separate unit on this. But for now, 
just put in a ballpark. If you put, if you were to put in, let's say you're making your product and you said, I'm making a popsicle and I'm going to sell my popsicle for $20 a piece, I will likely look at you and say, are you crazy? You've got to really, really justify why a popsicle should be $20 a piece. Now, if you come back to me and say my popsicle is 10 cents, you have to really justify to me why things are that price. We will walk through a whole costing module and there are two, two core models that are frequently done when pricing products. There's a price up model where you build out what's your cost of goods, your cost of ingredients, cost of labor, cost of overhead, and then you apply appropriate margins. So uh, margin for distribution, uh, shipping, a margin to the retailer, a margin to any of your warehousing. And that's a cost up model. And then there's the cost down model where you go and you look at your competitors and you say, my competitor for selling a popsicle over here is selling it at $2 a unit. My competitor over here is selling it at 89 cents a unit. And you find what is the typical range. And then you make sure that all of your other costs going backwards, so your ingredient costs, et cetera, are going to stay within that range. There's a little bit of give and take in both directions, and we will have a whole unit on that. For now, I just want you to ballpark what you think that price should be based off of some of those other things. We know that our customer stakeholders are going to be most likely middle class, um, and they're having this snack item as a bit of an adventure and a diversion. Right now, we can't be traveling because of the pandemic, and so oftentimes people are spending a little bit more on diversionary foods that are giving them a sense of satisfaction and a sense of treating themselves because you can't be treating yourself by going out to a restaurant. You can't be treating yourself by going on vacation. So instead they're putting a bit more money into premium desserts and premium alcohols and so on. So we're not just ballpark your price. The, uh, let's jump to the value statement. This project has value because right now it is unique in the mainstream marketplace. There are ice cream mochi products, but none of them have really broken through to Loblaws, Sobeys, and the mainstream retailers. And so that is one of the key aims of our client. He wants to sell this product into the mainstream uh, retail marketplace and not just as a niche product in Asian marketplace. And it will be also made in Canada. So this is something that we found when doing a competitive analysis on the frozen mochi was that the products that had been imported in from China and from other South Asian countries, they tended to be exhibiting temperature abuse, um, so crystallization in the ice cream. And as such, they were not as desirable a product and not inclined to be repeat sale. If it's made in Canada and the cold chain is really, really well maintained, then there's no reason that this product shouldn't be premium quality with exceptionally good texture in that ice cream. Why do I care about this project? Um, <laughs> you're gonna laugh because mochi ice cream, I, I, be, I keep bringing this up because the client that brought us the mochi ice cream project uh, several years ago, it just he just happens to be a really good family friend. Um, and I've been following his business and helping him out with his business for about 20 years now. Um, but why do I care about this? You do want to have a really, really important statement. And, and, and in this case, it's about optimizing the use of a unique piece of equipment. And in this case, Vince just happened to have a Rion encrusting machine, the, the machine that's necessary for extruding the frozen ice cream base into a um, glutinous rice shell. And he has that machine to be able to do that uh, multi-layered extrusion. And he wanted to find opportunities to use his Rion encruster in multiple ways to uh, maximize its productivity. So strengths and opportunities. We, you have done SWOT analysis and we will have another unit on SWOT analysis. But again, the yellow card tool, um, at this point, I'm just looking for some really high level thinking processes. You need to be able to stage gate your product to know that you are on the right track and that you're not just off on some fantasy. Why are there strengths or opportunities to sell this product? It's unique in the Canadian market. 
it overcomes the import issue and quality issues with it. The threats and weaknesses piece, this is where you want to be thinking about, are there any challenges? There's no, uh, in the case of the mochi ice cream, there's no intellectual property barriers. I don't know why it's bolding. So any other company could come out and do mochi ice cream too. And that is one of the biggest threats and weaknesses in product development in in any country. There's, there's not a lot of intellectual property that you can do to, to protect against your formulation. And there are product developers who are notorious for being able to take a look at a product and knock it off immediately. And um, it's just one of those skill sets that as you become more expert in product development, you just look at a product and you go, oh, I know exactly how that's made. Um, there are people who are just uh, code breakers specifically challenged with the ability to take a product and reverse engineer it just like that. So anyone could, if they wanted to buy a Rion, could start making this product. Um, are there other barriers to this? I think it's part of it is the consumer understanding. You want to make sure that people know what mochi is and know how to enjoy this product. If they have no understanding, you might have to be out there doing product sales or some sort of advertising campaign to show people how to eat this product and how, how to enjoy it. Otherwise, because it's a bit of an unknown phenomenon in the mainstream marketplace, um, many North American consumers may be um, unaware of what the product is and just pass it over on the shelves. Do we need to know anything more about this product? Um, we already talked about the fact that we want to do a bit of a research project. In, in reality, we already completed the research project, but we want to know a little bit more about the, the freezing properties of the dough because that's going to be one of the biggest textural barriers. We want to make sure that people are experiencing the chewy, um, bouncy texture that's enjoyable in mochi and not getting a crispy, crunchy, uh, break your teeth sort of texture on the external crust. So last but not least, we're going to give it a DFBI score. We will have a, another slideshow specifically on uh, um, using different feasibility matrices. DFEI scoring just happens to be um, how desirable is this? How much does it engage the consumer? Um, young consumers, I think it's a very high desirability. And for older consumers, there may be barriers to, to know, what it, know what it is. Feasibility comes down to, are you able to actually find a manufacturing strategy to get this product out the door? And feasibility implies, do you have a pathway to market? Oftentimes I have conversations with different product innovators, um, many entrepreneurs who come and say, I have got the greatest idea ever. It's fantastic, wonderful, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And Meanwhile, they have no clue about the manufacturing strategy. And secondly, there may not even be any companies within North America that are capable of uh, doing the fabrication work. Um, I was just having some conversations with uh, some professors at the University of Toronto, and they had a wonderful idea for a nutritious product. And they were reaching out to me to talk about different co-manufacturing strategies and I had to kindly tell them, based off of uh, the co-packing database that's out there, the only co-packers capable of doing this are in the United States right now. How do you feel about that? And they're like, isn't there anyone in Canada? I'm like, nope, there's no one in Canada. And they're like, how do we do this then? And I'm like, can you do it virtually? Can you set up a team in the States to do it for you and not go down there and do it yourself? And that feasibility suddenly changed drastically. But... Um, Oftentimes people come with these wonderful ideas and they really haven't been able to map out what are the unit operations or the uh, 
the manufacturing systems necessary to make it. And it's so much easier if you have a clear path, here's a manufacturer who's capable of making this, whereas if you are trying to piece together unique pieces of equipment, you may be the one who has to do that piecing yourself. So in the case of the mochi ice cream, it just happens that uh, he owns the equipment. But from a feasibility perspective, right now, if we talk about Vince and Gardena Foods, he owns the equipment. It happens to be in his um, general manufacturing plant. But if he is making a dairy product, he has to go to a dairy facility. And so he happens to be co-packing ice cream already. And so can he take the Rion extruder to the ice cream factory? But if you remember too, we also had a point in our in our in our project plan where we also had to say, can the dough be transported from one facility to the other? Viability is where we're talking about the business case behind this. Is there a really strong um, profitability? outcome from this is is there the capability of making money and selling this product because it's unique and it's on and we also think that the cost of goods is going to be in line with the profit margins that we want to put and the contribution margins that we are going to be achieving off this product i've got my friendly visitor in here having some cereal just in case you hear some noise that's all right you can you can have cereal <laughs> um, from a viability, we think there's good contribution margin. So we think that there's a good viability. So looking at this desirability, we've got high desirability in a younger skewing uh, demographic. We've got decent feasibility, but we've got some feasibility questions. We've got a good contribution margin on this product, and we know that the client has really good connections with a wide variety of retailers, including some of the large retailers such as Loblaws. And so as such, we think there's a very good innovation index. How, how Do we ever see bad innovation indexes? Absolutely. Sometimes people push an idea that has low desirability because they've got a cognitive bias. They think it's the most wonderful product, but it really, outside of their own personality or outside of their own circle, it's not desirable. Lots of times... Companies have ideas, but there's no feasibility to get it to market because the equipment, the technology, the, the compromises that have to be made to get that product out decrease the capability of uh, commercializing that product. And last but not least, there are so many products that have been pitched to me and people that I know that the cost of goods making this product is going to make it absolutely impossible to sell. And as such, the viability on it is extremely low. And so there are lots of times where companies come and we walk through this sort of uh, uh, funneling exercise where we, we get caught on one of these points. And that becomes a time where you have to really stop and reflect. We mentioned about stage gating. This is a really useful tool to walk through early stage innovations to ask that question is this an idea that we really should invest in, and pursue, and do additional research? And so if we have come to a major hiccup in any of these statements, then that's a time where we've got to stop and do more research or stop and actually ask ourselves, do we move ahead with this idea or do we find a new idea outright and just stop? Because there are times when it's way more logical to just stop. We're thinking about, you have the yellow card template, and I believe Norm is looking for you to do a yellow card for him. And so I'm not going to assign this as an assignment, but I want you to walk through and have some fun with the tool. And um, again, take a look at Eureka Ranch because that is the actual source of this document and see if there's value to you uh, in, in your future. Plan it out, perhaps take some courses in a future time to learn more about innovation engineering. Always look forward to your questions. Take care and have some fun.